uh, as part of the series of talks, uh, it's really a, 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 a very exciting to have this talk today for several reasons. Um, digital transformation is, of course, very much in everyone's mind. It's changing just about every industry, and the pace is not going to slow yeah, down. Yeah. So we're going to pick up with the new technologies that are coming of uh, uh, digital machine learning and everything that comes with it. And in science, yeah, we hear a lot about this from different sides, from the technologists in our operations department, the guys who come from MIT computer science and so on. We hear about the professors of strategy that talk about how industries will change and what you need to do to stay competitive. We hear from the marketing guys the impact that machine learning and digital technologies are going to have to do. Um, we hear from the economists and how changing transaction costs will change industrial structure and all of that. Uh, but there's a point of view that we tell them here as much, which is a very stakeholder on all of this, which is the side of the regulator. So it's a, it's a great privilege to have uh, Christopher uh, Q. Smith here. He is uh, responsible for regulating fintech for, for the fintech side of ADGM, which is the, the, the authority with whom we've had a uh, you know, great relationship. It's been uh, great for us as well to be here. So uh, deepening the, uh, developing the relationship is, uh, is another added benefit of having Christopher here. Uh, before joining ADGM, he worked uh, in, in the UK for the financial regulator there. So uh, despite his uh, exceedingly young books, he is actually quite a deeply experienced from the side of regulation. Uh, I've been asked also by Pascal, is Pascal, so if you have any comments or feedback that he wants to give in person, uh, Pascal is the person to talk to, he's responsible uh, uh, for organizing the tech talks and all our program around the digital transformation and innovation, but if we also appreciate, we always collect feedback relentlessly in everything we do, and so for the talks as well, if you have uh, feedback to give at the end of the talk, please go to this URL, digital.inca.edu, feedback. So, without further ado, Thank you very much, Miguel. Thank you very much, Insight, for having me here today. It's a real privilege to talk to all of you. Some of you are giving up your valuable evening and your free time to be here. Um, so, I've given various talks on topics around flash technology and certainly if you're blockchain. And um, I'm actually reminded of the very first time when I was at the UK regulator and I wrote the very first paper on digital technology, as we called it. Um, and my director, the director of our division, he only had one comment on the front of this final draft I'd written. <laughs> All it said was, it's a little dry. Right? And my response to him was, yeah, this is a paper about distributed databases in the context of financial services. It's not Game of Thrones, right? John Snow's gonna go out and start trading Bitcoin. But I am gonna try my best to make this as interesting, as useful as possible. Um, if you have any questions, just interrupt me. Um, you know, I don't, I've been not even know I want to hear my own voice for 40 minutes straight. As a quick straw poll, how many of you are involved in DLT or blockchain related enterprises or crypto related trading? Okay, fair few of you, that's it. How many of you are business focused? Okay. And how many of you are technology focused? Okay, great. Nice, nice, uh, nice split. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, I'm actually a lawyer by background, and uh, I come up with things very much from a business point of view. Um, so is this technology useful for my organization? Um, and as Miguel was saying, what sorts of regulation might we need? Does our, does our regulation need to be updated and changed because of this, of this type of technology? And that applies to not just the technology itself being used as the, the, um, the foundation of these new business products, but also in the context of crypto assets trading which I will touch on. <clears throat> okay, so um, I'll very quickly go through this so that we're all on the same page. The whole 
interests and usage of blockchain technologies started arguably with Bitcoin. In 2008, um, a person or group of people um, released a white paper that year um, detailing uh, blockchain, back then two separate words, as <clears throat> a, a medium of exchange, right? So essentially a new global currency. That was the goal. Um, now, if you think about the context of that year, obviously, there was the financial crisis. People had their faith in central banks in particular was greatly undermined. They didn't want to trust banks. They didn't want to trust central banks. So it was very much focused on the trust aspect of money, like right? not having to trust regulators like me, um, central banks, to look after your money because it could be worth nothing. Your assets could suddenly be worth nothing in the space of the matter. Day. And so the idea was to try and create a trustless system as a, as a medium of exchange. The genius of the Bitcoin blockchain was actually because it, com it combined many, several different um, aspects of computing which, which aren't actually that new. So peer to peer networks, if any of you remember Napster for um, music sharing, I'm sure none of you do because it was obviously illegal. Um, distributed databases, which um, have been around for quite some time. Cryptography, again, has been around for quite some time. Economic and game theory, which is really very, very important. I think an aspect of crypto asset networks, which is probably underplayed a little. So how do you incentivize people to participate in these sorts of networks, especially when you're trying to generate a token that represents value? Um, and especially if you're trying to use a medium of exchange. From an economic theory point of view, how do you get, how do you make sure that inflation is managed, right? The, the Bitcoin blockchain protocol manages this by a series of algorithms, right? And I'll come on to, come on to a bit more around that um, later on. As I mentioned, there's no central counterparty to trust us. I'm not relying on someone like the Bank of England to keep records of which banks have how much money uh, in, in reserves. And as a bank, um, there are, I don't keep records of my customers' holdings either. <clears throat> One of the things which the Bitcoin blockchain had to address is something that's actually quite well known in the computing world, it's known as the Byzantine Generals problem. And it's essentially a mental exercise around how the, the still as the story goes, you have several Byzantine generals that are all attacking a particular city. Now, how do you coordinate an attack by messenger, especially if one or more generals um, may actually be a traitor? Okay, how do you keep um, things true? Um, by, by complete coincidence, actually, um, this is the anniversary of the fall of Constantinople, which is the end of the Byzantine Empire. Um, I found out just the other day. But um, <clears throat> the, the way that Bitcoin addressed this problem, the Byzantine general problem, Right. was around the proof-of-work consensus method. Right? And this, is, this goes back to the whole game theory aspect of how the Bitcoin blockchain protocol works. You, make, you essentially you have to create incentives for people to add records and disincentives for them to try and change them. Now, the people who make records on the Bitcoin blockchain protocol are players, a yeah, term which some of you may be familiar with. And they have to vote significant resources in terms of computing power, in terms of buying the hardware, the electricity, to actually solve a mathematical puzzle. Because whenever transactions <coughs> need to be added to the existing ledger, what happens is, say I want to send um, some Bitcoin to one of my friends, <coughs> my, my computer will broadcast a transaction across the network. There are various processes to make sure that my transaction request is valid and fulfills certain criteria, and eventually one of these miners pick it up. Now, what the miners will do is they will take my transaction along with a pool of other transactions that are waiting to be added to the main ledger, and it will try and put them into blocks. Right? And these blocks are linked together, hence the name blockchain. If they are successful at linking at some um, at combining the transaction information into a block and solving this mathematical puzzle, then the block is added to the existing ledger and they are awarded in Bitcoin, which at the moment I think is trading just over 8,000 US dollars. Went up to massive amounts uh, last year, but um, it's a very lucrative business. And so in places like China, for example, there are massive server farms just devoted to mining Bitcoin. <coughs> 
<coughs> now, um, proof of work is was, was, was the first public consensus mechanism deployed in, in, in blockchain, but there are others. And there's proof of stake, which is in relation to how many tokens do you have, and the more tokens you have, the more weight of your vote, if you like, gets attributed. Um, there's, a, there's a way of using an oracle, which essentially you nominate a party um, that has control over what gets recorded. And uh, perhaps called Byzantine fault tolerance, which is what Hyperledger uses most of the time, at least, um, where you basically have multiple nodes, um, and they have to agree on the truth of a certain transaction by a two-thirds majority. So there's different ways of um, doing it, not necessarily just the proof of work um, because the mechanism. Before we go on, um, I think one of the really important things to, to very quickly touch on <coughs> is around the, whole, the distinction between public and private and, and permissionless and permissioned, right? And really, all this is, is around reading and writing, right? So when you have any given database, some people have the rights to read it, and some people have the rights to write to it, to change um, or add records to what's already there. And really, public and public is anyone can see records, private is only specific actors can see records, permissionless is about writing, it's about writing, so permissionless means anyone can write, and permission means only specific nominated parties can write. Okay? So with that, that backdrop, it's very, very important, this is really how you can differentiate between the different protocols, and also, if you're thinking about using these technologies for your organization, it's really crucial. It gets a little bit com more complicated with certain protocols. So, um, if I do, there we go. Um, the talk about Ethereum. <clears throat> so, I'll just quickly touch on it now. But there are, there's a version of, it of Ethereum pioneered by Jacob Wall called Quorum, and it combines a, um, a private um, instance of a blockchain with a public instance. And those two talk to each other. But before I go into that sort of detail, to just cover Ethereum very quickly. Um, Ethereum was groundbreaking in the blockchain space because it enables you to create software, right? So if the Bitcoin blockchain protocol says to people that uses it, I see what you see, right? That is essentially what the Bitcoin blockchain accomplishes. We, we all make sure that we're seeing the same stuff, or we make sure that it's very difficult to tamper with, okay? What Ethereum says is that the programs I execute are the, are the programs that you execute as well. Okay, so it's distributed um, execution, if you like, rather than simply distributed record keeping. <clears throat> Smart contracts was coined by the founder of the Future, and although I say I say that, it, it did appear in the, in the paper um, prior to Ethereum being founded, but he he made it famous certainly. Um, I think he actually retracted it as, as a phrase, um, but essentially it's like saying a program on a blockchain, right? So if this happens, please do that. That's really all that a smart contract does. And like like computer program generally, you can do that many, many times and create very, very complicated um, software and applications. <clears throat> Ethereum really trying to sell the idea of having a world computer. So being able to um, to distribute processing power for applications among lots of different people. And you would effectively pay for those applications in gas, which is the same thing as the token theory, ether, um, but the way that it's priced is, is, is different. So because gas is so important, because it's used every single time you execute virtually any command on the program on the Ethereum network, um, the price of it is much more controlled than ether, which fluctuates um, uh, on this much different um, <clears throat> So, on the on Ethereum, as I mentioned, there are there is a possibility of structure in a way that is private and permissioned. Um, and JP Morgan Quorum is, is one such is one such way. Um, and essentially, what happens is you run a, a private um, instance of um, Ethereum uh, and. The, the nodes are called Constellation, they talk to the public blockchain, uh, and it only sends encrypted values to the public blockchain as a record-keeping uh, device. But it's very, it's a very, it was very groundbreaking, but now you see other blockchains, like AOS, for example, is very, very important in terms of programmability. Uh, but this is, this is also very important in terms of blockchain application building. Um, 
I, I do want to quickly cover um, crypto in terms of its market size. This is a point to point market cap. It's $268 billion. Um, this is across 2,000 over uh, different crypto assets. Uh, and the, the market value for Bitcoin is comprises about 56% of that total market value. So it's still a, a massive, it is a very big market. A um, lot of people are trying to make money on the business. It's very much more of an investable asset, which is um, why many regulators like ADGM, like the FCA in the UK, like the Japanese, Singaporeans, even Hong Kong, um, <coughs> the SFC in Hong Kong, um, they are looking to regulate this. At the beginning, I said that Bitcoin's goal was to be a new medium of exchange. Right? But as we've all seen, the value of Bitcoin versus dollar has fluctuated an immense amount, especially over the last few years. And so it's no longer really stable enough to function as a medium of exchange for most people. Um, some people do use it that way, though. It's starting to behave a lot more like an investable asset, right? almost like putting your money into something like a share, like a bond. Um, as a result, that's the way that regulators are looking at it. And the sorts of controls and requirements that regulators are thinking of putting onto crypto uh, are very similar to those that already operate in the securities space. <coughs> right, so back to financial services. Okay. So, this is just a very quick uh, recap, we're all on the same page. Financial services, um, it's, it's a very complex market typically, especially if you're, if you're working in a capital market space, where I spend a lot of time on trade finance. Um, there are many counterparties, there's some client types. You have your retail clients, where there's typically more regulation. There are professional and institutional counterparties, where there's typically less regulation. Um, and essentially, a lot of financial services boils down to keeping lots of very long lists of stuff. So lists of transactions, lists of assets, lists of people, lists of companies, lots and lots of lists. And because distributed ledger technology is all about keeping lists of stuff securely and ensuring that you see what I see, that's why there's so much interest in financial services in regards to this sort of technology. <clears throat> financial services is obviously an immensely highly regulated um, industry. Um, in all sorts of ways, financial crime, making sure you're treating customers fairly, kind of market behavior, lots of reporting reconciliation requirements. So again, this goes down to the, these lists that I spoke about just now. So after Lehman, there was a big fear that banks were not keeping accurate records uh, of their clients' holdings, their own holdings, they were commingling um, their own funds, their clients' funds, maybe misusing their clients' funds. And so the the way that regulators thought they could try and mitigate that is by making institutions um, report to them what their holdings were and by reconciling accounts, their own accounts and client accounts, with their partners like custodians, for example, or, or securities depositors. <laughs> Typically, financial services has a very conservative attitude to technology change. Right? So I, I remember the gap between when cloud first arrived on the scene and its adoption, but it was, it was, quite, it was quite, a, quite a big gap. Um, and this is because if, if a large bank especially, or a large institution of any sort, wants to um, institute a new technology stack, it's very, very expensive. Right? So what you actually end up seeing in this new world of not just necessarily blockchain, just being pledge, but also things like AI and so forth, is these new young companies are delivering incredibly good quality services because they can harness the efficiency, they can harness the, the cost savings of <coughs> new technology like these. <coughs> So, in terms of financial services, you know, as a regulator, regulators' first interaction with blockchain was not at all positive, right? It was actually rather negative. Um, and these are the sorts of uh, headlines that really um, came out. So, you see, so Mt. Gox, a very famous um, Bitcoin exchange, um, lost 600 million US dollars. Um, and that led to the Japanese financial regulator regulating crypto asset markets. This happened in 2013, and I think the regulation came out about two years later. Um, the, this is Ethereum DAO. So a DAO is a distributed autonomous organization. So essentially it's a program that exists on the Ethereum protocol, and there's no central counterparty, and people participate according to the rules that are enshrined in the code of that particular application. 
people started to use the DAO, um, the capital T, uh, to effectively become an investment fund. And they put their ether in, which had a certain value, and they lost a lot of money. <coughs> now, this actually led to an SEC, uh, the front of the, front of the US regulators, an investigation on the DAO. So you've got the Japanese regulator and the American regulator. Top right, this is a, an article from um, a French uh, TV channel. Um, and this is around the, the awful attack that happened in Paris and how some of them were attributed, some of the, the money laundering done by terrorists was attributed to the use of Bitcoin. That led to the French government proposing to include crypto assets in the updated anti-money laundering directive of the EU. Um, now this is the bottom line, this is a more generic one from a German, um, <coughs> very famous newspaper, um, and this is essentially talking about um, how uh, when, when hackers and criminals um, do their shopping, um, they don't pay with credit cards, it's too risky. This, instead, um, they'll actually take bitcoins. Right. So this, this, is, this is how regulators first interact with this stuff, with this technology. And it's taken a very long time for regulators to release this kind of, oh, it's blockchain, therefore it's bitcoin, therefore it must be bad. Right. I think the more progressive the educated regulators have uh, managed to put their head around that, but I think certainly in some places there's still a bit more. Um, if you fast forward a few years after those sorts of events, you end up in this sort of situation, right? Now, I'm not going to say that this is what happens in either my previous organization or my current one, because this would be incriminating with my leadership. But um, essentially, a lot of people, especially those that have roles like mine, obviously not me, um, would have this conversation, right? So you're sitting at your desk, and someone senior comes up to you, and uh, all they say is, I think we should put a blockchain, right? And some senior guy, you know, business guy, whatever. Um, and uh, <laughs> the first thing that comes to your mind is, well, I wonder where he got this idea from, right? He probably doesn't understand what he just said, but he probably read it somewhere. Right? Um, so you need to sort of test this particular leader's kind of understanding. So, so, and so the way the deal manages is, what color do you want your blockchain? And the is, well, I think Mo has the most brand. Right? Um, and um, you know, this is just, I think this is, this is a great cartoon. First of all, actually, um, one thing to point out is that this cartoon wasn't named for blockchain. This was actually made in relation to, I think it was a new Oracle um, application, so a centralized database. Right? I think it's interesting because not only does it portray um, you know, the, the attitude of some uh, businesses in relation to blockchain, but also shows you how technology is, is very kind of cyclical. What's kind of really cool one day is not cool. So, all one digital data which is not centralized. Um, and this really led to a situation where the financial services ecosystem starts to really love blockchain, right? So going from you know anarcho geld as the Germans call this, and responsible for attacks in Paris and so forth, now financial services loves blockchain, right? And I think it's because, as I said, we made that change from attributing the cryptocurrency, which has historically um, been used for some criminal activity. Fiat currencies far more so, uh, magnitudes more so. But the technology itself um, can be used very, very well for a variety of uh, very good reasons. And so even the IMF, um, Madame Christine Lagarde, points out that actually you could use um, certain tools around um, blockchain and crypto assets to make the financial system safer, actually. Um, the uh, French magazine, Les Echo, um, called it the new El Dorado of companies to, uh, because of the efficiency it delivers to, to investment rate. Um, we've got a McKinsey article here, how blockchains could change the world. And there's an IBM, I'll have to keep it multilingual where I can. Um, yeah, this IBM basically just says that you should use IBM blockchain to build a new infrastructure and process financial services to make your transactions easier, faster, more efficient, and, um, and slicker. So um, this is kind of where we are now. People do realize there's an immense amount of potential for this technology, right? Because it's all about what I see is what you see. Okay? This, is, this, is what, this is why it's valuable, right? So you think about lane, you think about those lists, yeah? Think about your, your the client assets versus the proprietary assets, keeping them separate, making sure that they're accurately recorded, making sure there's an audit trail, making sure that it is secure, that it's resistant to hacking. Yeah? These are all advantages which this technology can offer you. 
right, if it's implemented correctly. Right? Now, <clears throat> these are just, so R3, Hyperledger Fabric, and Ethereum are probably three of the most used platforms of building blockchain-based applications currently. Um, and actually, before I go on, one of the things really worth, uh, worth touching on is um, when people use the term blockchain, right, there is, like, like most terms, a, uh, uh, people can be incredibly pedantic about how this, this word is used, right? And I, I used to be pretty pedantic, I probably am a little bit. But essentially, if you're talking about blockchain, really, in its truest form is, you're organizing data into blocks and you're linking them together using some sort of consensus mechanism, which is typically proof of work, right? Um, whereas, for example, R3 was criticized because it's not a blockchain. I guess my answer to that is who cares, right? Um, who cares if you're using a proper blockchain or not, or what is a proper blockchain? Really, all you need is something that gets your business done and gets it done well, securely, and efficiently, right? And hope doesn't break the bank either. So, <clears throat> these are some of the use cases that you've, got, you know, you've seen in, uh, in financial services. Um, you know, I used to be a derivatives lawyer, and you know, in, in a really geeky kind of way, if you can program all your derivatives cash flows and all the margin you have to post, so it's completely automated, you save a lot of money on lawyers, uh, lawyers like I used to be. Um, and and in, the, in the trade finance space as well, I'll go over an example. Imagine if everyone could see the same documents that banks have, that customs have. Um, and the securities issuance space is another one of my examples later in a little bit. Um, this is all about corporate finance desks and investment banks, which take a very, very big slice out of companies that are trying to raise capital to improve their business and to grow. Right? Um, in fund management, you think, I think um, actually Northern Trust uh, did a, a very interesting, I think it's actually running now, so business as usual. Um, they're managing some of their private equity uh, investor holdings using a Hyperledger application. <clears throat> and this list of institutions at the bottom here is, are some of the international financial institutions that are using it. And you've got banks, you've got exchanges, you've got um, custodians, you've got insurers, um, all looking, looking at this technology and in some cases actually um, deploying it uh, for real. Right, now I'm going to uh, undertake something which is slightly risky as a non-technological person, but I'm going to try my best to go through the, difference, the differences between some of these um, protocols, right, which hopefully may aid you in making, making some decisions. Um, so if you look at each of these three, um, these three in turn, so in terms, of, in terms of R3's quarter, the creators of R3, the language they use is called Kotlin, um, Hyperledger Fabric um, shows IBM actually um, are the ones that are primarily responsible for kicking it off, uh, but it is Linux based and the language is a Google language called Golang. Um, and Ethereum um, is a core developer group uh, that find this the future in the language of um, I touched on the read and write um, earlier on, um, and so uh, R3 Corda is really a, a digital ledger technology uh, inspired by blockchain, I think what they say. It is fully private, fully commissioned, and built for financial services, right? So that's certain advantages when it comes to building uh, financial services applications. <coughs> Hyperledger Fabric um, is, 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 is private and commissioned. Um, it has a broad, it has a, it's not just focused on financial services, they are touching on multiple industries. Um, and Ethereum, uh, you can have uh, private uh, instances as well as public funds, it's generally a so the consensus mechanism in terms of R3 Corda, um, really it's just transaction participants. So what is um, really important when it comes to using R3 Corda is to understand that actually it's not so much a ledger that everyone can see, right? Um, it is a point-to-point -point messaging system. Right? It's, almost, it's almost like SWIFT. Um, and Therefore, at a transactional level, only the parties to that one transaction that's happening can see what is going on. Hyperledger Fabric is a little bit more complicated um, because what happens is, rather than um, specify the visibility of information on a transactional level, typically you open something called a channel, um, and you open a channel.
a third counterparty to that channel, that third counterparty can see what's happened historically, which can cause problems, right? So if I've done a whole bunch of transactions, if I'm Barclays Bank, I transact with EMBD, um, we're off, and I do a whole bunch of transactions for three years, and then I invite Fab on, you know, Fab can see all my transactions over through the EMBD, which Fab may not, which <coughs> EMBD may not like my phone, like my phone. So um, that's um, that's my bit of fabric. They also have a, um, I touched on earlier, um, a concept of, uh, of leader nodes and validation nodes where the uh, transactions are broadcast to those in order to verify them. Um, and the, the, the leader node effectively uh, chooses, has much more power in terms of choosing what to add and what doesn't um, to the existing ledger. In terms of Ethereum, um, there are different structures available, typically to work with proof of stake, as was discussed earlier. Um, and then scalability. So, as, I, as we touched on the beginning of the presentation, the Bitcoin blockchain is very heavily dependent on this consensus mechanism which requires a lot of compute power to solve a mathematical problem. Right? And I remember seeing one statistic actually that said that the total amount of electricity required to run the Bitcoin blockchain protocol is about the electricity consumption of the country of Ireland. Right? Which is a lot of electricity. Right? So, um, as a result, High throughput transactions or on the Bitcoin Bitcoin protocol is, is really challenging. And in financial services, if for example you have an algorithmic trader, that might cause um, that might cause protocols that rely on that consistent mechanism to not be scalable enough. Corda, because it's a point of a messaging system, is actually it's extremely scalable, it's very, very powerful. Um, Hyperledger fabric, um, now because of the way that channels work, you always have to open a full channel. Well, that's what you, you normally have to open a full channel to different counterparties. And that number of channels increases exponentially the more participants there are in a given network. And there's a great paper by the Monetary Authority of Singapore around this in the, in the context of the central bank issuing a digital currency based on um, quarter fabric and Ethereum. That's in real detail. And Ethereum, I've said, given its concerns are higher because of this proof of work. Um, skip her <clears throat> right, so I'm going to quickly um, just touch on one, uh, on a couple of different use cases. Um, one in trade finance and one in securities issuance. So this is essentially how certain trade finance transactions operate. Um, you, there's a lot of documentation involved. It's all done by fax, it's done by courier, it's done by hard copy documents, right? It's very, very prone to, to error. It's very, very prone to fraud. Um, it's, it's in vast need of, uh, of an upgrade. Um, and I'm not gonna go through each of the steps, but you can see just, the, well, first of all, the number of steps that are, that are involved. Um, you can see the amount of documents that are involved, the amount of parties that are involved. And if you remember what the technology does for you is it's, it says that what you see is what I see. Okay? And in the context of trade finance, there are lots of documents where multiple different parties have to see the same documents. Right? They could be bank guarantees, obviously the, the contract itself, the purchase and sale. So I'll give you an example. If I'm a, if I'm a bank and I funded a buyer, okay, and I fund the buyer on the basis um, of, of a contract, but then the buyer, instead of allowing me knowing, changes the contract to either be a, a less amount, so I've overfunded this particular client, or more, so the client's taking on more risk. I don't know that's a bank, right? But my credit risk would have changed against the, this particular client. And so if I have a way of making sure that I can see those sort of changes, that's very powerful for me. Um, the other thing is, because this is all relying on faxes and couriers and intervention and so forth, it's very, very inefficient. Um, and it takes, it, takes, it takes a very long time. As a result, the kind of knock-on effect of this is that, especially if you're a small or medium-sized type enterprise, that getting financing is really, really hard. Right? If you can offer the trade finance industry a way of making it really easy to get the right information at the right time, it's accurate and it's secure, then that should stimulate more lending into the economy. Right? And AD German's government is very, very pro using technology to boost the SME sector um, uh, right now. So the sorts of models that you see a fair bit um, 
is this sort of model, where effectively you have a digital database. Um, it can be there can be different layers of cryptography in it. Whether it's a true blockchain or not is up for up for debate. But certainly, it's some sort of distributed ledger type technology where each party sees the same ledger. Um, each party has access to the same documents, and if, whenever one party tries to change something, everyone else sees it. Right? Um, seen a lot of stuff built on hype ledger and Ethereum um, for, for this sort of model. Um, and essentially, what it does is it makes sure that the government, the companies, and the transaction and the banks all have access to the same information. So, when the Ports and Customs Authority and government stamps a piece of paper, or in this case, obviously, signs something digitally, then it automatically updates. And the, the bank can see it that it's okay that products have gone through as can the buyer and sellers. This is a very, if this can be implemented successfully, and there are tons of projects, right? There's a project from Marco Polo that's based in Hartley Corda. Um, there's one between um, Maersk, the shipper, um, and IBM, obviously on Hyperledger. It's a very, very, it's something which people are really trying to um, implement at the moment. But one of the interesting things is that when you're trying to attack these big problems, right, the problem is never the technology. The problem is never the technology, right? And if I, whenever I get the question about using blockchain, using DLT, okay, they say like, you know, what, what sort of advice do you have? Like, this typically happens at the end of a panel, right? You spend 45 minutes talking about this technology, lots of complicated questions, and they have any tips, right? So in the space of about 10 seconds, we give some amazing piece of information. What I always say is, forget the technology, okay? Think about the governance. Okay, think about the people involved, think about the companies involved, think about how you're going to get them all on site on the same page. That's harder, a lot harder. Okay. At EDGM, we did two projects, one on KYC, and we're working on one now on trade finance, and it's really hard, right? Trying to get the governments to agree with banks and the SME sector and the shippers, there are so many people involved in this process, and they all have to agree to use the same platform. Yeah, it's very tough, it's very tough. But if you can nail it, it will be extraordinarily powerful. Question on um, So, you know, trade finance obviously is a global issue. So, would you say that this would only work if there's like one or two winners, you know, like like the standards that then actually get used and rolled out slowly to everybody in the world? Or could this coexist with like 50 different types of systems, mm. you know, say, uh, Europe, Europe uses one, mm. you know, uh, Southeast Asia uses one, but they kind of have to learn or mm. adopt the technology of the other part of the world if they want to you know, also use that. Or, you know, how's that going to, how's the rollout going to happen? I, yeah. I kind of feel like there's so many solutions out there, but it'll take still another decade or two until we agree on which one to use. Yes, absolutely, yeah. I guess in my, my personal opinion is that there's, there's not going to be one protocol to rule them all, right, for any use case, okay? Um, so you can take trade finance, for example. I don't think there's going to be one all singing, all dancing, uh, digital database, which lets you manage all trade finance anywhere in the world, okay? Not least because, you know, regionally, um, so, so China, really interestingly, um, they are massive into blockchain, right? Uh, not that they used to be massive into crypto, it's got abandoned, but in terms of technology itself, they have immense capability. In that area, it's fascinating. Um, and there's a very prominent, um, massive financial service group called Ping Han in, uh, in China. And they have a, a truly amazing technology uh, group that build blockchain applications. They actually took Hyperledger, right, and kind of tweaked it a little bit. Um, and so, what you, you, know, you may well see is you know, a, an instance of Hyperledger in, in Asia, say in China, and Singapore, and Hong Kong, um, trying to talk to a Corda type. Um, protocol uh, uh, software in Europe, and it's that interoperability that is so important, right? In order for everyone to actually do this, and it's incredibly, incredibly challenging. So, if, for example, so currently actually, Hyper, the um, Hyperledger uh, Foundation, they are talking to R three, and they are trying to integrate Corda with um, with Hyperledger applications. I can't remember what was in the context of trade finance, but certainly I know that Ping An um, did try to um, in, to integrate some of their hyperledger based applications. This is on behalf of Hong Kong Central Bank with um, 
one of the R3 Corda consortiums. Um, I'm not sure they got to on that. Um, yeah, I can't unfortunately show you some of the details in my last conversation, but it is really tricky, right? I can say that. Um, because as I said, they, the, way they met, the way they send information to participants on these applications is, is very different. Right? And, and especially if you compare Hyperledger and R3. So R3 is a point-to-point -point messaging system, not unlike SWIFT. Okay? Hyperledger opens channels where you see everything right? between, two, between two participants. So trying to um, integrate these is going to be a massive, massive challenge. Right? I, don't, I think you're right. I think we are quite a while away from there. I don't think there's going to be one winner. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, a VHS versus Betamax type discussion. Right? I think it's a case of multiple protocols operating alongside each other. I think that there may potentially be some concentration in certain uh, financial sectors. So you may well find a scenario where Ethereum uh, is really popular for the trade finance and uh, R3 be popular for securities, I don't know. But then you may see that. But it's really, this technology is so young, right? we don't know the answer to these questions yet. Um, but um, interoperability is, is, is absolutely crucial for everyone to be able to talk to you. Do you think that any model like this model, any AI like this with the work of the software and integrate all the things? Is this a service model? Yeah. Service model, yeah. I'm sorry, was your question around? Oh, Swift, I'm oh, sorry. Um, so, um, so, Swift has already um, experimented with um, some of this technology, and they also came to a similar conclusion as the Central Bank of Singapore that Hyperledger wasn't suitable for the sort of throughput which they need. Okay? Um, and I think that it's, it's a good question in terms of if the banks, your, your question was around if banks would end up using a protocol like, like they do Swift, right? Um, that's a, it's a very, very good question. I don't think that, um, I, I would be surprised if all banks use just one, right? Mm. So, you know, it's, um, open source is a really good way to try and increase the rate of adoption, right, without a doubt, okay? Um, but a lot of, um, like, blockchain-type um, protocols are open source, right? Ethereum's open source, Backledger is, some parts of Corda um, are as well. Um, and it's not, it's not a, you know, I mean, these days I feel that, like it is a prerequisite, but it's not sufficient. Um, in order to be adopted en masse by all participants in the financial sector. Um, I don't, I th as I said, I think um, we're still some fair time away from understanding if there will be one. I'd be surprised if there was just one to rule them all. Um, but um, I think that may happen, I might be wrong. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> I think this is Swift, comparing Swift to these sort of technologies, it's, um, it's, it's quite challenging because Swift is a, is, is a, messaging, it's a messaging system, messaging format. Right? Whereas what we're talking about here is our actual applications, full-blown software. Like everyone has to. It's sort of like, it, it would be, it'd be, I think it's more comparable to think about Microsoft Office, right? And, and, and comparing that sort of thing to, say, certain blockchain applications. Because we, all of us, use in our daily office lives, right, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, Adobe, PDF, not the readers, yeah. Um, I think that trying to get that sort of adoption now, you know, Bill Gates, way back when, was extremely smart in how he managed to deploy Microsoft apps everywhere. Um, but I think, I don't think that any blockchain protocol can replicate the journey that Microsoft went on to get that scale of adoption. I don't think it's possible. There's still competition. Um, so I said, I'm really interested to see where the market goes in terms of the protocol that's adopted, but it's impossible to say what we're Yes, exactly right. And that's the challenge, right? 
I mean, <clears throat> to be fair, you know, there's, you know, if you think, look at the CTO function of any given financial institution, you're not just going to have a developer that codes only in Python, right? You want to do a few different things. You want to, you know, you need a few tools to develop, right? You can't just have, you can't just rely on a hammer, right? A hammer's not good for everything. Just like you know, Ethereum is not a good friend, you want to be very good at certain things, but it's not good for everything. Um, I think that you, you know, we'll see here. Uh, one of the things that um, I really look forward to is when people stop using the word blockchain, right? And so we call it my IT. You know what I mean? Like when it kind of, so when it's normalizes, I feel like that's when we'll know whether which one, first of all, will be mass adopted, um, and we'll know that actually um, it's useful and it's, it can, can be used by multiple people safely. Okay, so this is a, a, a subject very close to my heart. Um, as I may have known, used to be a lawyer. Um, we have some phenomenal uh, companies in the ABGM doing this right now. Um, truly, truly amazing uh, enterprise level um, applications. So uh, please, please do look them up. They're, they are listed on the web, on the website. But this is the, um, this is the current world securities market, right? Any of you who have corporate finance, you know this very well. Um, now what, we're, what you see here, essentially what I've done is, if you look at the issuer and the investors, okay? These are the most important people in this diagram, aren't they? Yeah. The issuer is trying to raise money, okay? And the investors are willing to invest their money, and they're trying to see a return on capital, okay? They are the only people that matter in this diagram, okay? Everyone else is really frankly superfluous. Right. Okay. So, yeah, in terms of like actually kind of adding value and, and doing all this business, I feel like these guys are definitely the most important. But in order for an issuer to raise money from investors, okay, there's all this other stuff around everywhere, you know, that has to kind of go on, right? There are awful lawyers like me, um, there's office, there's technology back office, there's an originator bank, there's investment banks and syndicates. The custodians involved, you have to record them, the securities depository, the security, secondary market for trading. Like, there's a lot of guff that kind of goes along with raising. for finding the investors through the typical network or syndicate. Um, the, the lawyers are responsible for drafting documentation, and even though they're using a bunch of templates, they're still charged the same as if they drafted it from blank for some reason. Um, they, um, the ops and back office staff often have to intervene, a lot of, a lot of have to undertake a lot of manual intervention in order to get these securities out there and into the world. Um, the custodians, once they are out in the world, the investors have them. The custodians do security servicing to make sure that dividends get paid, to make sure that bond coupons are paid, to make sure uh, that share splits are administered effectively. Um, central securities depository effectively makes sure that everyone knows how much they hold, um, and the securities markets where all the trading happens. Now, um, this is the model which we have today, um, and this, you know, we, this is really an evolution of, so for example, if you take secondary market trading, you know, this is essentially, we just digitized the, the bull ring, right? That pit of uh, traders, right? S screaming out orders and writing on chalkboards what they want to buy and sell. Um, we haven't really had a chance yet as a market to really rethink how securities issuance and trading works. But if you look at some of the applications that are out there currently, I mean, this is really what it looks like a lot more, right? Literally no one else, just the guys in green, okay? Just the guys in green using what was hopefully a very well written uh, piece of technology. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that this is necessarily, especially from a regulator's point of view, a perfect model. Okay, you want investors, you want investors to be protected, right? You want to make sure that their rights are being preserved, um, and you also want the issuers protected, right? You want to make sure they're getting the right amount of money, uh, to make sure the reputation of being undermined, all sorts of. Things. 
<coughs> but we've seen this model already in the context of the ICO market, my right? initial coin offering, our initial token offering market, where people were raising billions of dollars, completely unregulated, from investors across the, in the internet. Um, and it was very easy, and you have, and it was a, it's a market rife with issues around fraud and scams. Some people, they, did, they, they issued ICOs um, to raise money to buy themselves a car, and somehow managed to buy themselves investors. It's very bizarre. Um, so <clears throat> this model, whilst it is feasible using this technology, I don't, I'm not saying it's ideal, but it's where we could get to. And I think that what's important to know is that you could maybe just shave off some inefficiency that's happening um, in the middle here of the diagram, right? You can certainly get rid of lawyers, which I think no, and no one will disagree with on that. Um, so you think about automating the process, right? automating the creation of documentation, automating the process of making payment, of receiving securities, of servicing the securities. You can, as an issuer, you can raise capital more efficiently and more cheaply. Right? Which is really what financial services are about, about providing a service. Right, so I can raise finance. I think sometimes we lose sight of that. Um, so one of the last things I want to touch on um, is stable coins. <clears throat> so it's quite ironic. The reason why I say that we're coming full circle is because the Bitcoin, Bitcoin was intended to be even with exchange. It was supposed to be a substitute for dollars and pounds and dirhams, right? Didn't turn out that way, not, not quite. And so what's happened, especially in the last couple of years become increasingly popular is this concept of stable coins. Essentially it's a token that purports to be um, more have a more stable value. And the way it achieves this um, is by either typically backing it with some form of asset, and that asset can be fiat currencies, dollars, pounds, dirhams. It can be assets such as securities, even things like Bitcoin, um, or it could be a stable you can maintain stability by using algorithms. So essentially you're mimicking what a central bank does in controlling the, um, the flow of money into an economy. And the reason why this is so interesting is because there's clearly a demand for this, right? People want to be able to, for example, trade in and out of crypto without having to suffer massive uh, spikes and being able to look to, um, to get out of their investments in crypto uh, more easily. And this, I think this is where partially this comes from. But if you leave crypto to one side, right, this can be incredibly powerful as well. If you can actually have properly tokenized fiat, and in a perfect world will be done by a central bank, but I think we're probably a little bit away from that as well. But if a custodian was to do it, for example, right, were to hold fiat in properly regulated client money bank account, and were to issue tokens for things like securities trading, right? Blockchain for securities markets is great, but what the technology does currently is allow you to deliver um, security, right? So the, the D, the DVP. Right? What we, what I think the industry is still trying to solve for is the P leg, the payment leg. Yeah. So you, you deliver your securities to whoever needs them really efficiently, okay, using blockchain routes. But the payment still has to happen the traditional way, right, among the banks. That's why fiat tokens can be incredibly, incredibly powerful. Right, you've got the DVP happening superficially in both legs. Um, and that's um, something to really think about. Just to round off on a positive note, um, or not, um, the so crypto and blockchain uh, risks and issues, right, it's not perfect. Um, one of the things that people often say about blockchain is that they are super secure. And the protocol is really secure. Things are hashed and encrypted you know, multiple times. It's, in fact, it is a very, very secure underlying protocol. But as we learn from various different instances, from things like the DAO, with your lost points I mentioned earlier, the applications, the software being written that sits on top of these protocols isn't always very good, right? And there are bodies out there like MIT in the US that do vet applications when you ask them to, and they do find holes. But these applications is where the hacking happens, not the base protocols, the application layer. So that needs to be very, very heavily scrutinized. Um, I touched on investor risk and then ICO scams. Exchanges like Mt. Gox going down. There's one recently in Canada called Codriga that went down because the CEO unfortunately passed away, but that left the exchange in chaos. Um, 
Bitcoin, as I mentioned, is a very volatile asset, um, so you can lose money, you can make money, lose money. Um, and we've seen uh, instances of classic market manipulation, right? So things like pump and dump. Um, so you buy, you, uh, you you artificially inflate the the price of a certain asset by buying lots, and then when it raises a certain level, you sell all your holdings at that, that increased price and make some money. Um, and because things like crypto assets are not regulated in that way in most jurisdictions, we do regulate that in AGM. But in most jurisdictions, it's not. And so as an investor, you are um, at risk for this sort of activity. Um, one of the things I also want to touch on is around my laundry financial crime. As I mentioned, you know, regulators' first kind of interaction with Bitcoin was, uh, was not particularly positive. But if you put this into context, fiat currency, right, according to the UN, um, this, was, this was just last year, between 800 billion and 2 trillion dollars, or 2 to 5 percent of global GDP, um, was constituted by money laundering, okay, or fiat currency. In Europe only, and I admit it's Europe only, but this figure is still just a fraction um, of what, uh, for Bitcoin, of what fiat currency was. And even the UK government said of, um, of digital currencies like Bitcoin, the risk of money laundering is actually quite low. Okay. So, trying to, as I said, trying to really be slightly more rational in how we assess the technology, but also the cryptocurrencies themselves. That being said, this particular government report did say that um, Bitcoin and other crypto assets are being used for cyber-related crime, so extortion. Right? Typically, a um, hacker will try and break into a company, seize valuable data, and then ransom that data out and get asked to pay it in Bitcoin. It has facilitated that sort of activity. One of the things definitely was mentioning is getting our expertise in, right? Developers, right? So if you think lawyers are expensive, try and get an Ethereum developer in. Okay? Trust me, they're not cheap. Um, and even the lawyers themselves, okay? Um, you know, trying to find informed legal advice that really understand the in and outs of, for example, if I do undertake a transaction in securities using a blockchain protocol, right? Things like settlement finality, how does that happen? Can you legally do that? That's really hard. And we touched on this earlier on around interoperability, right? The demo and beta max. Like, don't be, don't you know, That's why you do have to look at multiple protocols. Hire, unfortunately, you have to hire quite cross discipline in order to remain effective uh, in this industry. All right. So that's that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening. Thank you. I think we. It's uh, eight thirty-five, but uh, you know we still have a bit of time for questions. Is that okay, Chris? Thank you. Uh, I'm a classic financier, and I still don't understand the idea behind um, Bitcoin, especially. Um, I think listening to you, it wasn't clear. It seemed to me that you were also unclear as to whether uh, it is uh, to be considered an asset class or a store of value. And if there is a store of value, um, you talked about something like that. Is it fiat yeah, tokens or something like that? Uh, every store of value is back from some fundamental asset, an uh, underlying asset. For instance, the US dollar is used to be back to gold and other. Currencies are backed by the US dollar. So, how do you actually assign or ascribe a value to something which essentially has no fundamental value? So, I think in the context of the dollar, right, I mean, as you said, it used to be backed by uh, currency, it no longer is. The value of the dollar is simply controlled by the Federal Reserve, that's mathematics. So, <clears throat> in that respect, there are similarities with it. However, I, sorry if I wasn't clear, but I, I don't think Bitcoin is, is particularly, is, for most people, it's not stable enough to use a store of value. There are countries in South America that are trying to use Bitcoin as a store of value because their domestic currency is even more volatile. There's, there are instances where it's being used as that. In, in many markets, in some more modern markets, um, more sale markets, they are viewed more, um, more as an asset rather than to store of value. As I mentioned, um, the risks that they carry are very similar to those you see in securities markets. Right? People are treating it as an investment asset, trying to get a capital return, things like Bitcoin. 
when I was talking about fiat tokens, I wasn't talking about Bitcoin. I was talking about assigning 